show really revolves around the tapestry and the other pieces, the paper pieces, are kind of products of how this thing grew into what it is. So all of the voices that were in the piece came from um, like two and a half hour long interviews with 40 participants. Um, some of them were just from an open call, so random people who I became friends with um, who entered and decided to do this for me, and some other people were friends. Um, and so all of the audio in the background of the tapestry is just little pieces from those interviews. And the interview questions were all centered around trying to understand who this person was sitting in front of me and how they became that person. Um, so a lot of them were deeply personal and intrusive, but they signed up for that, so <laughs> they were my victim for that period of time. <laughs> um, and people were very willing also. That was something that was surprising, but at the same time, yeah, at the same time it's not very surprising because it's a lot easier to expose yourself in front of someone who you're meeting for the first time than it would be to expose yourself in front of someone who you think already knows you. Um, and so a lot of times these were kind of like confessional book type feeling things and like I felt like a therapist sometimes. Um, I had people thank me at the end for the therapy session as they called it. So it was always interesting to me to understand like why did this person say yes? Why did they come here and why did they give so much? Um, and it was very clear that the most successful interviews were coming from people who were there for themselves. Like they were there to find something out and not from people who necessarily already kind of had themselves figured out, but people who were there to kind of to do work with me. Um, and so what I want to do is just basically give you a map of the process and of what you're looking at so that you have um, an entry point into this because it is something that is hard for me to view with fresh eyes because I've been with it for years now um, and it's been in my mind for even longer. Um, and so I know that it's kind of foreign to everyone and it's a lot to take in at once and so I'm going to try to just give a map but at the same time I myself haven't had enough time away from it yet to really understand the experience and aftermath of it um, and I also would be robbing you of something if I just kind of told you what everything meant um, I'm also a teacher so I feel that that's a necessary part of the process for you to be confused and feel lost a bit um, and figure it out on your own. <laughs> um, and so the starting point of this piece of some years ago was really based in my living together with my grandmother. Um, when she was living in our house after she got very sick, I was just kind of watching this person who didn't understand the seemingly didn't understand the gravity of the needs of her life of what she wanted for herself um, to put it simply and so that question of like how did you become this person this thing almost and do I have the same path ahead of me was really really weighed on me in those years and um, it was that at the same time I was reading this book that was suggested to me um, that was called Barabbas and it is a fictional retelling of Barabbas who was exchanged in place of Jesus of Nazareth um, so he got freedom and Jesus was crucified and the fictional retelling starts with him watching the crucifixion from behind the bushes and then you see the rest of his life and how he becomes who he is. It's just a chronicle of his shitty decisions, all of these relationships that 
present themselves to him that he ruins in a flash. Um, but also you see like his environment and the things that also formed him. Like it's not all his fault. <laughs> and you really, you feel him um, and his formation. And so I was just so taken by this portrait. That book was really a portrait. Um, and so I started to just imagine him as a garden. And so that's why the name stuck, Barabbas' Garden. Even though it became clearly a forest, um, the name remained because garden, the word garden implies that somewhere outside of all of this untamed land, there's actually a border. There's actually an end, a fence. That, that marks where this land belongs. And a garden implies that it was created with intention and that it's actually been cared for during its whole life. And so the name was very important during the thought process of the piece. Um, even though I needed the texture and the life of the piece to be unruly like him, like what we think of him as. And so, um, and so I was also, I was working with audio a lot at that time, and I just really love sculpting with people's voices. I think it really brings you into a piece like almost nothing else can. Um, and so the different textures and the speeds, I, I hope at least that it really, it takes you into the movement of the piece. Um, and so I'll briefly go through the panels um, to understand the inspiration behind all of them. But so basically, what we're looking at is a storyline, the way it functions. And so we see a lot of like cyclical natures of a decision that he'll make, and then he'll go back completely on, and then it repeats like all of these chances. Um, that were just squandered, and, and he's not even surprised with himself at this point. Like, so, so we get a lot of senses like that from it. Um, so these first three here, the green panels, um, are all sewn by machine, and the reason for that is because it cramps the fabric up. So it's very uncomfortable and awkward feeling when you're looking at it and all of the stitch marks are nervous because they're zigzag lines practically. Um, and so these three panels are all just like these flashing scenes of disinterest. Like you're just moving quickly through things. You don't really want to stick on any one of them. There's not enough interest there for you. So these are just like anxious and nervousness and disinterest um, in the beginning. Nothing is really pulling him in. And then we hit the burning panel. So that's right at the start of something. Um, we see the future of all of this lively, wavy, wavy grass here and what's going to happen to it, um, that it will just become this smoking like blue coal, basically, in the background. So we see it coming, but this kind of caution tape-like um, trunk is just stopping us. And so there's nothing we can do about it, but we see the start of something, um, of something burning. And then right when that's happening, it's immediately stopped. And something, this wall comes in front of us before we can watch what happens, what the product of that burning is in his life. So this green panel is really meant to be Barabbas's mind, the inside walls of it. So it, there's depth in the complication, the complications that are there, but it's flat. So the, this very backmost area is on the same plane feels on the same plane of space as the frontmost trunks to flatten it into this wall that you're just stopped by. Um, and there's a lot of symbols that I could go into because this one just kind of made me mad. Um, but so there's a lot of throughout the whole piece there's a lot of botanical symbolism because 
in my work, I want there to always be enough and more for any type of viewer, um, which is why it's hard to talk about because I don't want to just be an encyclopedia up here in front of you. But <laughs> um, I think some of the most important ones, uh, the first one is the Halder monkey that's here. And he's one of my favorite parts, actually. Yeah, so the Howler monkey. So he's the first face that we see. Um, and so the Howler monkey lets out one of the loudest um, monkey sounds in the jungle. <laughs> and, but it's not this like taunting screech. It's this low, deep rumble. And he does it once in the morning at like 4 a.m. and then once at night only for the purpose of letting everyone else know that that's his spot and he doesn't want any trouble. So like, if you stay there, he stays here, it's fine. So, this, so <coughs> the voices up until this point have been consistent in each panel, and then this is the first panel where there are no words. It's only <coughs> sounds. And all of the sounds that you heard in this panel were bits of people's words and phrases that were just manipulated until they sounded like animal sounds. And so even though there's all of this sound and chaos going on in this panel of his mind, there's no clear communication. So there's nothing that's actually being said. It's just sounds and chaos. Um, and so yeah, so this is the only one where there's a face, there's an open mouth, we can see it, the urgency of it, but we're not getting anything that we can take back from it. There's nothing communicated to us. Um, there are phrases written, there's text along the edges of the trees, it's easy to miss, but they work as a narrative going from left to right, and they pair with each tree, if you see it when you go downstairs. Um, and so, what do I want to say <laughs> about this piece? Um, so, we have symbols like man cut trees that would symbolize you know, his own self-destruction mixed in with these vines that can't live on their own, so they grow up along other trees and start the trees themselves that are covered in vines end up growing uh, farther away from each other. They will grow so that their branches are farther. And then the vines have evolved to coil so that they can still wrap from one tree to the next. Um, and so it's talking a lot about the different relationships that happen on their own in nature and using it as a metaphor for <coughs> human relationships. Um, and so, for example, this plant down here lets off the scent of rotting flesh. And so, um, so it's the most luscious looking plant in the whole panel, the most um, attention grabbing, but then it's just this hard smell and it has nothing to offer us but that. Um, and so then down in the corner, there's this like muddy puddle area um, that when we look at the later panel, the next panel, um, this is all that Barabbas is reminded of when he sees this lake that's all the way off into the distance that seems like his destination. Um, but when he sees that, he's reminded of the puddle that was disgusting and muddy and side of his mind. Um, and so when we get to this one, it's finally the breaking point. So there's this fence created by the trees in front that are still kind of holding him back. And right on the other side of them is this cliff that just drops off. Um, so also in this area back here, it's open. We can we can see a distance that just extends for forever, but again, it's within boundaries. So it's held and there are physical limitations 
but it's still just as scary because it seems like it would never end. Um, oh, and then there are two other things of importance here, actually. So in the reflection down here, it was actually this photo of my boyfriend's gross knuckles that are all like banged up and <laughs> and everything. Um, but so I took this photo a few years ago of him holding these flowers and the contrast between their purity in his hands was just enough for me to add it in <laughs> with epoxy. And so, um, so this is the most real thing that's in the piece because it's a photo. Um, but we only see it as a reflection of this puddle. So we sense that there's something more real to grab onto, but it's only a reflection. So there's a lot of these, like him reaching for something and never being able to get to it, um, never feeling that it's possible. And then this area up here, it, you might not have noticed, but there's a face in the foliage at the top. And that's a repeat of a piece that I made during college of my grandmother on her deathbed. And so she, in the end of her life, she couldn't swallow. So I had to like use those wet swabs to keep her mouth from getting too dry. And um, she would always take off the oxygen mask because she just hated it. And so this piece is called the deposition simply because, long story short, um, the deposition scene in Christian art is when um, Jesus' friends are first able to assist him physically. Um, every time before that, all they can do is just kind of stand and watch. And so that was my week with her in the hospital. And, um, but so she's repeated here with her mouth open. This time it's more of an exhale, like Barabbas is finally sort of able to breathe. This is the most open panel we have, the most grandiose, and there's that clear, airy sky. Um, but it's also to kind of mirror the howler up here. The mouth is in the same position, but it's a very different, it's for a very different cause this time. Um, but the two can be mistaken. Um, can you zoom into that? The face? Yeah. Yeah. It won't be too clear. Yeah, so she's kind of built into the, the leaves. Um, and so also the audio of this panel has some of the mothers that I interviewed singing um, mixed with the, the interviews that were the portions that were gradually more and more personal. So we come away from this kind of calloused talk that we do of ourselves in the first few panels to really physically opening up in a visual way and also the people's voices. You know, they start to quiver, they start to get lower, they start to open more. Um, and then in the last corner, in the edge of this piece, it starts to burn away to show the last panel, and so this is the last panel for this show, even though in later shows it'll have more panels afterward. Um, I thought this was the best place to end for this show because this is, so this panel is the same image as this composition, so it's just the aftermath of it. So then we understand that this entire time that area has been burning, and this is the first time that we're able to see it in the aftermath um, and a step further back. And then this tree here is the Socropia tree, and it's called the pioneer species because it'll be the first to come into burned or eroded land um, and give shade so that other plants can start to and how it the land again. And so it kind of completes the cycle. We end in this dry, um, burned condition, but somehow in a better place, right? So that's at least what I've experienced is this cyclical nature of myself 
and yet I can never fully say that I'm in exactly the same person, in the same place that I was at an earlier time. Um, and then, so all of these portrait prints that came out of it were of the interviewees. So just a few of the prints are downstairs. Um, and so this is bouquet one and two. And so these are wood lithography prints with some pastel on them. And in this piece, it's inspired by a, self, a double self-portrait by Egan Sheila, um, where he's in this same position. Um, and so he kind of, fun both sides of himself function as one unit. And so for this piece, I chose the same arrangement because I interviewed both of them there are actually a couple in real life. I have one of them sitting right there. <laughs> and, um, and I interviewed both of them separate, so they didn't know what they said about each other, but that um, inspired the arrangement of the piece. So um, she, we, you know, he's kind of looking past us to we don't know what he's seeing right now, but she really needs that connection. And so she's not only connecting him but connecting us to them and between the two pieces it's called bouquet because of the shirt the flowers on the shirt <laughs> but because a bouquet is not just flowers that grow on the ground but it's flowers that were picked that were given and so in this way the the flowers are speaking about the affection that you know trades places within a relationship but it's intact it's in the same position at all times, but but it's traded between the two. And then we have some other of the interviewees. Um, and then this larger one um, is called, Is He Who You Thought He Would Be? Um, which is one of the questions, the interview questions, um, that wasn't used for most people, it was for one person. But, um, so these two people never met before, but I did some double portraits based on what people said in their interviews. And so this is actually the other artist in residence who is here with me at this time, and she's a tapestry maker as well. So in her hand is a piece of folded cloth. And, um, and the exchange between them seems like he's waiting on, on her word of something. And at the same time, she's kind of lost in thought and looking beyond him. So you can interpret that it's kind of like a father, a son, mother relationship, where a mother is a creator in some way, and she's used to forming something up until a certain point when it's kind of forming itself. And so this was this question and title and piece was kind of inspired by some of the um, son-mother relationships that I've observed in my friendships where there is that point where a mother has to reckon with what her son is that might not always be what she thought it would be. Um, and then this one is just called mouth because of the interview week in particular that um, his experiences were ones that would make you feel stifled your voice and like um, but at the same time he's a poet and so there is a lot of this feeling of his reckoning with his own ability to speak for himself in his interview and so I, when I picture him, I picture an open window with a breeze um, pushing the curtains out of the way, and mouth seemed to be the best title for him. Um, and so, I want I wanted to give an, a light overview. I, I don't want to walk through too many of the symbols or anything like that. Um, just because I feel like it would be kind of heavy. Um, but so, in, in the future exhibitions, there will also be a recording booth, so people who visit the exhibition can come in and they'll be able to record their own responses 
to the questions that I asked in the interviews, and then the audio will continue to grow in that way. Um, and there will be more panels. There's also voicemails that will be added into the audio because they have such a wonderful way of tracking the development of a person. So I've saved my voicemails over the past 10 years. So I have voicemails from people, you know, sometimes pre-puberty. <laughs> and um, and you, can, you can really get a sense of that person's life in those 10 years just by the pacing of their voice in certain in certain recordings and um, and what they're talking about and it also gives you such an intimate tone more than I could ever get from even a one-on-one -on -one interview with someone who knows they're being recorded um, I have permission because you sent me the recording you called my phone <laughs> but at the same time it's like they are really only talking to me and there's something in the quality of that voice that you can't replicate in any other way and so That'll be saved for later panels that are more intimate and quiet. Um, but so that's what the future of the piece um, holds. There are lots of other things that I <laughs> would like to say, but um, I also want to open it up to questions because I like I know the details of the piece. I know the item specs, but I'm kind of like the last person who can judge the piece because I've lived with it so long. Um, so if there are any questions, I can try to answer them now and I'd like to hear people's thoughts. Otherwise, we can head back down. So in the fifth and sixth windows, are those mental aberrations, like you know, an illusion of some sort that we, we just don't see what's actually behind it covered, like you said, once we move into five, it covers what's actually happening. So is it just kind of a mental image of, I guess, from the perspective of Clarabas in this case for five and six, we're just seeing what is his mind. Rather. Right, yeah, exactly. For You're talking about these two, right? Yeah. Yeah, for those two panels, it's more like that when that, once that wall comes up with the green panel, you can no longer see the burning that's actually happening in reality. All you're seeing is the bouncing around that happens in his head of his self-image, um, of his choices that are laid out in front of him, even easy choices, choices that seem easy but just aren't what he thinks he can decide for himself. It almost seems like when I see this transition from four to five and six that something bad has occurred, it's maybe potentially self self caused and sometimes in our inability to essentially um, confront what we have done, mm -hmm. we sometimes try to fall back on our in on our self image of you know, it's where we can't possibly be that bad, or I guess like mm -hmm. this idea of we're kind of self excusing ourselves. Yeah. So then four and five kind of shows that kind of retracement to safety of like our own understanding of who we want to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we have to kind of come to the realization that, right, that something has to change clearly. And that's kind of seems like where the last panel it seems to be that rebirth of understanding that this, this something new to come, but it has to be. It has to be built up back up, basically. Yeah, from zero. Yeah. Yeah, so in that middle panel, because it's so close and so flat, you would think that the decisions would, like when you're alone, you would think that it would be easier to make decisions without having so many voices and inputs coming from different places, but that ends up being the most confusing, like chaotic, densely filled panel because you know, the ball is going to bounce more if it's in a room that big between the walls than if it's, you know, if you get what I'm saying. Like, mm -hmm. it has nothing to do but just hit back and forth and multiply. What would you say would be the prevailing uh, emotion of the piece, your sense of emotion? 
or that you're trying to feel that you felt doing it or that you're trying to convey or elicit from your audience? Yeah, I, I really, I wanted to make, and this sounds like really morbid, but I wanted to make a home for pain, kind of, but in a comforting way. You know, I wanted this to be a place where people can be with other people's pain in a way that isn't always possible in person. And it's easier to do that when you don't know the person whose pain it is. Um, and that, I'm pulling that a lot from, you know, my relationship with my grandmother. There's so much that, that I understood about my abilities once it was too late, you know. So, so it's kind of like an archive of the pain um, because like I have an archive of her pain in my mind so it's a way of saying like it's worth listening to it's worth being the soundtrack to a forest you know it's not it's it's worth too much for it to just stay inside of your head you know I wanted to have a comfortable place to be around people. Then you told us about the karma story. Inspiration to you. But how did you get from there to conceiving? I'm going to make an art piece that's a combination of movie recordings and textile tapestries. So how did how did the actual concept of what this art piece looks like and the medium media that you're employing, how did that how did you come to develop that idea? Yeah, well I was working in tapestry a lot at the time. Like when I made the pieces of my multiple pieces of my grandma and so I just like I wanted to sew, like when I came off of that, I just wanted to keep sewing. Um, so originally, he was supposed to be depicted as this lush, flowered forest, um, and then later on it, I realized that wasn't always suited for him, but um, I, I just, when I read the book, I just started seeing him as a garden because I saw that it was fertile ground, his experiences, and that it's the same as with the garden. You know, you can you start with the soil that is able, and some things grow in it and some things don't. Um, and also, like, a lot of the plants that are represented don't actually grow in the same places together, but they're coexisting here so that it's more chaotic, it's more unstable feeling. So I just felt like the botanical and environmental references best described him because we feel like nature is set in one way and that it's unchangeable, the same way that we are kind of unchangeable um, and just at the whim of, of our environment, of whatever we are. Um, <laughs> yeah. um, so when you're doing the interviews, well, my first question is, how, how far along in the conceiving of the whole project were you when you started doing the interviews? Like, yeah, was it, conceived. like, I mean, oh. what stage of, of making the... So, the actual sewing of any fabric started in, like, late May, <laughs> um, but... So I was doing research at the National Park residency that I was at um, two summers ago, and then I did all the interviews when I was here at the Sheen Center last winter. Um, and so I, I couldn't really start on the imagery until I understood what the story was, which was going to be formed by the interviewees and what they said. So the imagery was like my way of answering those interview questions and then my hope was that at the by the end of this their answers of all of these random people together 
would create a narrative that merged, which it did. Like, in the end, I kind of heard the same story 40 times. Like, I want to be loved. I push people away, or they don't love me enough, and I don't get love. Like, <laughs> that was kind of the story every time in different details, but I want to be loved was the story. <laughs> um, and so, yeah, and, and also, um, the interviews were also kind of an experiment to see, like, what happens in the first few hours of meeting someone. So they were really, they weren't really built for the friends who I did the interviews with. They were really built as, like, a very intense, almost first date type of thing. Um, and there were questions that I always wanted to ask people, but there was never really an appropriate occasion to ask but they were my victim for the time because <laughs> like, I could. Um, did I answer that? Or? Yeah, I, yeah I, I was just trying to understand the relationship between the development of the taxi yeah. and, the, and the interview. So that was really, yeah. and I guess the other thing I was wondering is like how the interviews themselves, like did you find that you learned something about yourself from them? Yeah. <laughs> um, I learned that like even though I have serious issues communicating, somehow people do understand me and that, I mean, to put it in a really like mushy way, they have similar experiences as I do. Like, that's the part that I'm still sitting with and I'm still learning. Um, because during the interviews, like, I was sketching their portrait, I was making sure the audio was okay. So. It was hard because I could only be with them so much, um, and I was really with them a lot more once I was editing the audio. You know, like, like I missed you guys when I was editing the audio really badly, which is weird because I only knew them, most people, for a couple of hours beforehand. But, um, but yeah, so that part I'm still sitting with because the imagery is is unfinished and still fresh, so it feels like my answers to the questions are still fresh and unfinished. Um, what kind of questions did you ask? Um, there were 90 questions. There, there, were, there were some buffer questions, like cutesy things, like, you know, would you prefer outer space or whatever, yeah. yeah. But um, the, the ones that were um, that were the real questions were just kind of about your bringing up, your view of yourself, um, what you want for yourself, and whether or not you've gotten it. Or I have to get it. In other words, yeah. Different ways of asking those questions, basically. Mm -hmm. Do you look for you? <laughs> what did you expect going into this? You said that you had this thought to do this three years ago, living with just the idea. Yeah. And and then actually working on it for so long. What were you what was your expectation going in and what from what has resulted, what do you feel like you have received? And I'm sure it's it's really Yeah. <laughs> um that's a good question because I feel like I live on my expectations. <laughs> um, but no, man, like, I feel like I expected, obviously, like, way too much, because, you know, when I got this thing out of the little room that I was building it in, and it came into a real place outside of my world, I just thought it was the most, like, decrepit-looking, underfed piece of creature ever, like, <laughs> um, so... I don't know how much I should pay attention to my expectations, but um, I guess those that would be more on a trivial, trivial um, layer. But I think I was expecting to like really just be as deep as I could with this person who I wanted to know so much. Oh, the the battery not saying. Um, through. Like, I wanted to see how real he was, I guess. And I wanted to see, 
because before this, you know, I was working in portraiture a lot directly, and so I guess I wanted to see like how good can I make a portrait? I mean, like how well can I really know you through some leaves? <laughs> <laughs> um, and how well are you going to let me know you, too? Because that's a big part of it. I wanted to be a social artist, and I guess this was the best I could do because I'm only so social. <laughs> but yeah, I wanted to find out, like, can art actually help people? Can I know you enough to help you and to help me? Um, I don't know if I can give you any more of an abstract answer. <laughs> but, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's interesting because the voices in the in behind the panels, they're your voice. Yeah. And that was a big thing. I mean, not so much that I want it to be my voice, but I wanted it to not be as much of a collage. I wanted you to really feel like it was the same person talking um, with different tones of their voice, the same way that when you're excited, your voice gets high. When you're tired or sick, it gets low. Like I wanted it to be the different angles of that one person. Um, yeah, because even a person like the character of Barabbas, we characterize in a certain way, but then I found out later that like he wasn't even um, this horrible beast. Like it's thought that he was just a protester, and like the government didn't like him protesting, so they depicted him in this way. But like I grew up thinking he was a man eater, literally. You know, like so. So yeah, I, I wanted to feel like this one person who you can just barely believe is one person because they're all these different. This painting or something. <laughs> you know. In the piece, um, the interaction between the individual character, whether it be the, um, the Howler Monkey or the. Uh, they seem to be interacting, it just seems to be perhaps from a first person sort of perspective, each window, the kind of we're looking in, right? Mm -hmm. um, and individual characters kind of interact with, with us, uh, but do they, in, I, maybe, um, the, the interaction between the individual mm -hmm. characters within the individual windows, is that part, I mean, do you, is that part of the intention as well here, is to see the interaction amongst the individual characters um, in the... Not as much because that would skew the vision of it being one person. Right. Um, at the same time, like, I did want it to seem like you are just in that head talking to yourself the whole time. So, yeah, I was trying to balance the line of, like, there's a conversation with multiple ends of the conversation happening, but it's still within one unit, which is how I feel when I talk to myself. Like, <laughs> And then when you reach the height of it in the green panel, it's just like, animal sounds, you know, <laughs> like, because it's incoherent, you know, when you reach that level of internal thought, it's just like, you're not productive anymore, it's just animal sounds, <laughs> you know. Do you have any plans on how you're going to develop, develop it further? Oh yeah, like I had, I have specific plans for the next panels that just, you know, didn't get finished for this uh -huh. one, and also it fits in the space best like this. Um, but yeah, and, and also these, it's not just that there will be later panels, but these pieces um, also will be changed. So that's part of the experience of the piece is that only whoever has seen this show will know this piece as who it was at this time. Um, and so, yeah, so like when I look at that middle green piece, it's totally bare because I know of all of these things that are missing that will come later in his life. Um, um, that, yeah. Well, it's, so like his future experiences of the panels will also impact his memory of 
of his past. Thank you, Jen. I think we want some time to go see the uh, exhibit downstairs, but thank you very much.